X-ray tube. Having covered most of the components of the X-ray machine in our previous video, let us now learn about the most important part, the X-ray tube. X-ray tube is like the heart of the X-ray machine, primarily consisting of a glass envelope, a negative cathode, and a positive anode. Let's take a closer look into each of these parts. The glass envelope is a vacuum tube that encases the cathode and the anode. It protects these elements from corroding and burning up. When producing X-rays, the glass envelope heats up significantly. Therefore, it is made of a unique heat-tolerant material known as borosilicate glass, also known as pyrex glass. The central area of the glass tube has a window through which the X-rays come out. The cathode consists of a filament and a focusing cup. The filament is made of tungsten and is supported by two stiff wires that allow current to flow into the filament, heating it up and releasing electrons. In order to understand how these electrons are created, we would need to examine the filament at a microscopic level. Here we will see a process called thermionic emission taking place. It involves electrons from the heated tungsten atoms being pushed out of their shells and released as free ions once they gain sufficient energy higher than their own binding energy. Thus the word thermionic where thermo means heat and ion refers to the free electron released. Multiple free electrons accumulate and form an electron cloud or a space charge around the filament. Over time, the filament gets vaporized into gaseous form because of the heat and solidifies on the glass of the X-ray tube. This is called sunburning or sun tanning of the tube. This consequently leads to reduced output of the X-ray tube, destruction of the vacuum and ultimately tube failure. To delay this process, thorium, a radioactive metallic element, is added to the filament material. Now imagine what would happen when a lot of negatively charged electrons come together. They will repel each other and spread all around the tube. But is this what we need? Absolutely not. What we need is a neatly channeled narrow beam of electrons that would further give us a narrow X-ray beam, thereby a good quality image. So here is where the other important component of the cathode, called the focusing cup, comes into play. This is a negatively charged concave reflector made of nickel or molybdenum. It repels all the electrons produced, pressing them back together. This restricts the size of the electron cloud, thereby producing a narrow electron beam, which is directed at a small rectangular area in the anode, called the target. Now coming to the anode. We already know that it produces X-rays by converting the kinetic energy of the incoming electrons. It consists of a wafer-thin tungsten plate called the target, embedded in a solid copper stem. It is important to understand that the target has to be made of a material that meets with certain criteria to be called ideal. First, the chosen element must have a high atomic number. An elevated atomic number indicates a high concentration of protons within the nucleus, which implies that the nucleus is highly charged. This causes greater deceleration and deflection of the incoming electrons, producing higher energy radiation. Second, it should have a high melting point, which means it doesn't melt at high temperatures. Thirdly, it should have a low vapor pressure, 
which is the tendency of a material to change into a gaseous state, so that the target material doesn't evaporate at high temperatures. And lastly, the target material must have a high specific heat. This refers to the quantity of heat required to increase the temperature of a substance by 1 degree. A high specific heat will help aid heat dissipation. So how does tungsten become our ideal target material? Tungsten has a high atomic number, that is, 74. A high melting point of 3380 degrees Celsius and a low vapor pressure. The only criteria that it does not meet is that of having a high specific heat. To compensate for this, the tungsten target is embedded in a copper block, which is a good thermal conductor. Let us now discuss a very important area of the anode, called the focal spot. This is a region on the tungsten target onto which the focusing cup directs the electrons. The actual size of the focal spot is 1 mm by 3 mm. We must keep in mind that the size of the focal spot influences the quality of the radiographic image. This means a small focal spot increases the sharpness of the image. However, having a large focal spot also has its advantages because it dissipates more heat. So now, how can we achieve a high-resolution image without generating much heat? This can be done by positioning the target at a 20-degree angle to the X-ray beam so that we get a reduced effective focal spot size of 1 by 1 millimeter, while maintaining the actual focal spot of 1 by 3 millimeter. This is known as line focus principle and the 20 degree angulation is known as angle of truncation. Another method of dissipating heat from a small focal spot is to use a rotating anode. In the rotating anode, the tungsten target is in the form of a small beveled disc that rotates when the tube is in operation. As a result, electrons strike successive areas of the target and heat gets dissipated over a large area. Such rotating anodes are not used in conventional dental X-ray machines, but may be used in cephalometric or extraoral X-ray machines. Conventional dental X-ray machines use fixed anodes that stay stationary while in function. An important point to remember at this stage is that there is a limit to how much one can angulate the target to reach the effective focal spot size. Exceeding this will cause a variation in the X-ray beam's intensity across the X-ray field. There will be fewer X-ray photons on the anode side of the beam when compared to the cathode side. This is called the anode heel effect and will be dealt with in detail in another video. To power the X-ray tube, transformers are housed within the tube head. They can be of three types. The step-down transformer, the step-up transformer, and the auto-transformer. The step-down transformer reduces the voltage from the regular 110 to 220 volts to a lower 3 to 4 volts. This is required for the electric current to flow into the cathode filament forming the electron cloud and is controlled by the milliampere setting in the control panel. The step-up transformer increases the voltage from the regular 110 to 220 volts to a much higher 65,000 to 100,000 volts needed to accelerate electrons from the cathode to the anode. This is controlled by the kilo voltage peak setting in the control panel. The auto transformer corrects small fluctuations in the current. So now that we have understood the detailed makeup of the heart of the X-ray machine, let us see how it beats and brings life to the machine.
When the X-ray machine is turned on, the electric current enters the control panel and then flows through the electrical wires in the extension arm to reach the tube head. The step-down transformer lowers the voltage from 110 to 220 to 3 to 5 volts before it reaches the filament in the cathode. This heats the tungsten filament and thermionic emission occurs, resulting in the formation of an electron cloud. This electron cloud remains in position till the exposure button is pushed. Once the exposure button is pushed, the step-up transformer raises the current voltage from 110 to 220 to 65,000 to 100,000 volts, causing the electron cloud to accelerate across the tube to the anode. Here, the molybdenum focusing cup helps stream the electrons towards the focal spot. When the electrons strike the target focal spot, less than 1% of their kinetic energy is converted to X-ray energy and the other 99% is released as heat. Based on how the incoming electrons interact with the tungsten target atoms, characteristic and Bremsstrahlung radiation is produced. Out of the X-rays produced, 70% is emitted as Bremsstrahlung radiation. Now the heat produced at the anode is absorbed by the copper stem and the insulating oil in the tube head. The X-rays produced exit from the X-ray tube via the unleaded glass window portion of the tube, passing through the tube head seal, aluminium filters, collimator, and out towards the patient through the PID. So this is the story of how X-rays are produced. What happens from here will be covered in our upcoming videos. We hope you had fun learning with us.